So way back in 1993, I lived in Beijing for four months. At that time, the city was in the process of bidding to host its first Olympic Games, something that would happen more than a decade later. And the center of the city was still dotted with small hutongs, or traditional alleys. A mere four years after the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre, freedom of expression was still highly monitored. And while there was a large state-run art gallery, it tended to feature large social realist and pop-inflected figural work. And as for an independent gallery scene, well, there just wasn't one. Still, even at that early date, a small cohort of Chinese artists, often known as the New Wave, were producing really provocative work, and sometimes even doing so on the very steps of the National Gallery, under the watchful eye of administrators. In that work, and in work executed in more surreptitious locations, Chinese artists often ruminated on the complex distances and developing relationships between their own training, interests, and horizons of possibility, and Western precedents and ideas with which they were increasingly conversant. Indeed, the relationship between China and the West was the central theme of a clever 1987 work by Huang Yongping when he tossed two histories of art, one discussing Chinese art and the other offering a history of Euro-American painting, into a washing machine. The concrete result, of course, was predictable, a soggy mass of pulp with the original texts and images utterly lost and indecipherable. But the concept behind the piece remains compelling even today. What happens when two very different artistic traditions are brought together? Do they merge into a homogenous whole? Or do they simply become nonsensical, their meanings effaced? Huang's seemingly simple piece leaves both possibilities open. A few years later, in the early 1990s, Chu Jiezhe developed his interest in calligraphy, and specifically in its performative elements, into a memorable merger of traditional idiom and modern process-driven work. Chu began by acknowledging an established Chinese tradition of copying canonical texts, which would include the famous Orchid Pavilion preface, which was executed by a master calligrapher back in the 4th century and is still widely revered as a model of cursive script. Like a dedicated student, Chu repeatedly rendered in freehand the same text as if to master its meaning and style. But he did so again and again on a single sheet of paper, slowly obliterating his original marks and gradually turning the sheet into a solid black field of ink. Over a period of years, he wrote out the text a thousand times in a rote ritual that introduced an element of time or duration into the piece while also arguably encoding the characters through blunt repetition into his arm. And yet the end result, again, was flatly unintelligible in any literal sense. Process, Chu seemed to imply, was at least as meaningful as content, and the solid, resolute mass was thus a testimony to a long, sustained period of meditation, rather than an attempt to communicate clearly and efficiently. A concern with duration also informed a challenging piece by Zhang Huan, in which, uh, which he executed in 1994. Zhang was familiar with the physically grueling or even dangerous works of Chris Burden, the performance artist who had had himself shot and locked in a bus station locker, among other things. But even as he ruminated on Burden's example, Zhang wanted to make a point about specifically Chinese conditions, such as the squalid condition of many public restrooms. In 12 square meters, Zhang slathered his naked body in fish oil and honey and then posed for a full hour in a filthy urinal. Flies, of course, soon congregated, buzzing about him, landing upon him, but Zhang maintained a stoic composure that faintly recalled the meditative calm of the Buddha or the resoluteness of Buddhist monks, such as those who had self-immolated in Vietnam. And yet the point here wasn't grand analogy or melodrama, Rather, Zhang's piece was an exercise in quiet, understated activism. Simply enduring, he seemed to suggest, could be a significant trial. Zhang was one of several artists who forged a meaningful creative community in what became known as Beijing's East Village. Located on the edges of the city, it was a network of friends who had met in art school and who shared an interest in provocative performance work, and who were often reprimanded by unhappy governmental officials.
Soon, Western observers began to take notice. And in 1993, the American author and LGBTQ activist Andrew Solomon was sent to China by the New York Times Magazine to report on the contemporary art scene. Solomon's detailed report fascinated many Western curators, dealers, and collectors, who soon began to arrive in China to seek out the artists he had discussed. This was, of course, an exciting moment for some of the artists, but it was also disruptive and disorienting, as they were soon subject to gazes and market forces that they hadn't necessarily anticipated. And in a plaintive but funny 1994 painting, Zhou Tiahai registered his unease, depicting Solomon as a dandy arriving in a boat commanded by Marco Polo. Solomon's visit was, Joe suggested, hardly innocent, but rather bound up in a longer history of so-called discovery and exploitation. But Joe's satirical parody couldn't stop the larger tides. Also in 1993, Ai Weiwei returned to Beijing after a decade in New York City and its East Village. Ai played a galvanizing role in the formation of Beijing's playfully named East Village, quickly publishing three books that focused on his peers. And he extended his own artistic practice as well, often combining a nimble conceptualism with aspects of performance art. In this work, for instance, he shattered an ancient urn, reminding Chinese viewers, perhaps, of the violence of the Cultural Revolution and calling attention to the real costs of rapid modernization, but alluding at the same time to themes common in Western art, such as vanitas themes of impermanence or the found object, or the photograph as index and record. Within a decade, I would become one of the most famous figures in the art world, due to his involvement in the design of Beijing's National Stadium, his provocative political art and subsequent house imprisonment, and his role in producing as an expatriate in the 2000s a stream of activist films. But back in 1993, he was only one in a small group of Beijing artists who may have been little known in a global sense, but were already producing work that would soon gain a much wider audience.